just like the last performance. It's very similar. But it's about, a t <laughs> it's, it's about um, atomic scale quantum physics. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which I, I know you're all familiar with, and so I'm, I'm only assuming a PhD level knowledge, so it'll be easy for you. Um, as Tim said, we're, we're building at the smallest conceivable scale. We're building with atoms. And it's hard to describe that to you in great detail, but I can show you a lot of pictures that help. And so I'll do that today. I'll show you that. We can make smaller things, obviously. But it turns out that at the smallest scale, things aren't just the same but smaller. They can also be smaller and very different. You've heard of quantum computing and things like that. Those kinds of properties and capabilities begin to emerge at this scale. Um, this is also, I think, the ultimate green tech, something our world needs desperately now. It's using minuscule amounts of material. You may have heard of a milligram or a nanogram. Um, those are huge compared to what we're talking about, a billion times bigger. Um, we can make things that use very little material, have very little processing uh, chemicals, none actually, and are completely recyclable. And as I will mostly focus on, we can make the most efficient computers. Now, that's not just a objective for the heck of it, it turns out that your, each one of you, your carbon footprint from using your computer is now worse than your carbon footprint due to flying. So you all know that you should feel a little guilty about flying too often. Well, I'm sorry, but you should feel guilty about using your computer. And so, and the trend that we're on that is using more and more computers for artificial intelligence things every time you talk to Siri or something like that, you're using a lot of energy. And so we, we desperately need computers that are much more efficient. We think we can make them 100 times more efficient. Now, I'm going to propel all of this by a discussion of this fantastic tool, the STM, a scanning tunneling microscope. The people who developed it a few decades ago got a Nobel Prize, uh, very deservedly so. But I and a whole community of people around the world have continued to develop that machine and make it ever more capable. It allows you to see individual atoms. These are the atoms of a silicon surface, the very same chip that's in your computer today. It's about a 10 million times magnified, as you see it there, just routine. And <laughs> I notice that STM also seems to stand for see, touch, and move. So with this tool, we see in the sense that we move a very fine probe around, and we just trace out topography. There are no lenses. It's, it's not like any other microscope. And it's like a record player. You know, The record player has a very fine needle that follows the bumps and wiggles in a groove, and it reinterprets uh, that and makes, ultimately, your speaker shake and recreates the music. If you took a record player, and I am recommending you try this at home, and you, you dragged it around, well, you'd need some computer-controlled things to do it. But if you moved a record player cartridge around, you could actually generate microscopic images with close to micron, millionth of a meter resolution, in your kitchen. Um, we go to even more extreme lengths, and, and I'll show you. We make that needle atomically sharp. So people have previously moved and touched atoms with this kind of probe tool. A guy named Don Eigler at IBM did this most famously a couple decades ago. And he moved individual atoms around to spell out some, some letters. But what he did was akin, as this picture suggests, to sculpting in clay. Clay moves very easily in response to some force of your fingers, a probe. Um, and so it's on the one hand, easy to work with, but the disadvantage is it's easy to damage. It's very fragile. We need to do something more like sculpting in granite. We need to hit the material with a hammer and a chisel. And the chisel needs to be atomically sharp. Um, and so we proceeded to make one. Um, what you're seeing is the end of a needle pointing at you, and every tiny white dot there Every tiny white dot is an individual atom. And we're sharpening it until 
There's only one perfect apex atom. We can do this every day of the week, anytime you want. And if, <laughs> and if, we, if we lose that atom, we see the three atoms on which it's sitting, and we can sharpen it again and reconstruct it. And given more time, I'd tell you all kinds of neat things about that. But today, I'll just say it's the tool we've developed that's very robust to, in turn, move other atoms around. So here, I'm typing out 150 with atoms, silicon atoms. And you see there, we made a mistake, <laughs> a typing error. So luckily, we developed an atomic editing. We actually published a paper where we called this atomic whiteout. And <laughs> I, it, it didn't get rejected. I thought that was some copyright infringement. But, <laughs> um, and so you can see, if you watch very closely, that one outstanding atom was removed. And if you watch this little black line right here, we can remove that. And now that void just below it. So we can actually make a perfect error-free structure and any number of them. We then went on to make the smallest maple leaf for Canada's 150th birthday a couple of years ago. And you might find it funny to know that our colleagues at the University of Waterloo, they got a Guinness Book of World Records for this smallest flag. Um, and that little red pixel you might be able to see, that's our flag within theirs. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the Guinness, you, you won't believe this, but the Guinness people, I hope they see this presentation. They refused to give us the, the record. They said that we beat them so badly that there was no competition left, and they didn't want to participate in that. So we didn't get the record. So I should have two Guinness records, but I only have one. Here we've printed all the letters of the alphabet and even some music, because the theme music to the Super Mario video game. And atomic, it's, and most importantly, and now, I know you can't read that, but that's exactly the kind of code that your computer today uses, but it's the most compact information storage ever achieved. And it's totally permanent. It lasts forever. So now I've told you, up till now, static structures can be made. But I want to do more than that. I want to, that's my best PowerPoint effect. I'll do, <laughs> I'll do that again. There. Anyway. So, so atoms. Atoms are more than little blobs of stuff. They are like nests. The, an atom is a thing that sequesters electrons. So here I'm showing a nest for an egg. An atom is a kind of nest for an electron. And we can put multiple atoms together, in this case with one egg, if you like, or one electron. And we can, through electric field effects, we can move the electrons to the other side. And so that's binary information. That's just like in any computer today, except it's the smallest bit ever made. And we can make any number of those. Now, that's dynamic, not static. Now, we could make deeper nests, that is, more st stable um, ways to hold the electrons. And that's what's in our computers today, figuratively. We have over stabilized our information. And so we're paying a very high price for moving electrons. And we don't need them that stable. Thank you very much. So it's like you had a nest in a tree where the walls of the nest were so high that the blowing of the tree could withstand a hurricane that rarely, if ever, happens. And so you won't lose the eggs. You won't lose the electrons. But you don't need that much stability. And so what we've done, essentially, is we've made, it's like the three bears, we've made a, a binary bit out of atoms, which is just right. And so this is partly how we save so much energy. Now I've told you about atoms and about bits, and now I'm going to put some of them together, and I'm going to tell you about circuitry. See, it's all very easy. We move <laughs> atoms, electrons, among atoms, under the control of other electrons. Electrons repel electrons. We can pass information along a line without the use of conventional electricity. And that saves a tremendous amount of energy, too. And here, we have a designed collision or intersection of lines. And we're achieving the first ever atomic logic operation. And now, 
that's not just cartoons, it, it really exists. So we don't have time to go through all of this, but this top left point, you see six atoms that we've positioned. There are three electrons among those six atoms, and they are doing what electrons do, they repel one another. So they're staying at the outermost vertices of this structure. But look here, if we put another atom, uh, the laser pointer you see up here, we put another atom there, which is another negative charge, and it's pushing this electron, which was resting here, under the influence of these guys, it's now been pushed up to here. So I, I won't go through every step, because we don't have time, but I hope you see that the things you saw in the cartoons are real and, and really exist, and they take minuscule amounts of energy. So the last piece of the puzzle it regard, it relates to automation. If I had only achieved what I've just shown you, and that only took 30 years, we could <laughs> be quite happy, and I was quite happy with that, but I wanted to do more. I wanted to actually make practical working devices that are green and that change the world and, and, and are, are useful. So doing what I've shown you so far wouldn't achieve that because it's very arduous, it's very difficult to move atoms. It's, it's a finicky business, as you can imagine. But we've managed to train computers to do this now. So this little illustration suggests that we're making one, two, then three, four, then five, six atoms with no problem. And see, we made a seventh one up here. And then you see this kind of ghost image. That's due to the tip becoming imperfect. And to make a long story short, this guy is very clever now. He not only recognized that aberrant behavior, but fixes it, goes back to work, and now you see that ghost-like image is missing, and it's perfect, and then we go on and make an eighth atom, and so on. And so there's no reason now why we can't automate and parallelize this. And so this little movie shows you that happening. This is the idea that you would move things as you wish, but you would be doing many such processes all at the same time, and you'd be building stuff in a significant way, and you'd be making the greenest, fastest, smallest stuff ever made. So I, I dare say that what we've done, and not all my colleagues would, would agree, but I dare say that what we've done is we've made an atomic scale device which is to the transistor as, and you can't see that, as disruptive as the transistor was to the vacuum tube. So this is entirely revolutionary, it'll change everything. We just need the political will, actually, to put effort into these ultra-green, I think, world-saving processes instead of carrying on the way we have been. So um, the very first speaker of the day told you to, told all of us to tell suppliers, uh, what do I do with my cardboard boxes? While you're on the phone with them, tell them <laughs> you want Bob <laughs> to make um, atomic devices because it'll help save the planet. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>